Um, let me turn now to um, the ground war, search and destroy. And here, really, I'm, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about um, the disagreement among revisionists because it is significant. Um, the debate among revisionists is over the importance of um, the guerrilla insurgency versus the assertion that what the United States faced was a standard invasion, a conventional war. In other words, what kind of war was um, North Vietnam fighting to conquer South Vietnam? I want to stress here that um, the revisionists who talk about guerrilla insurgency and um, drawing its strength from peasant discontent are not making the same argument as the orthodox historians, who essentially argue that we had no alternative. Um, yes, we fought this ground war as we did between 65 and 68, but there was no alternative. Um, the revisionists are revisionists precisely because they argue that we did have options. Um, um, the, um, the ones who, who, who argue you know, for counterinsurgency and emphasis counterinsurgency argue that we did have options. Basically what they are, are critics of um, search and destroy and General Westmoreland. And this was centered, for those of you who are um, in the Marines, although you have Army people who criticized it too. Anyhow, there are two poles in this debate, as I see it, One rep both by uh, Army colonels. One is represented by Andrew Kopernovich, uh, who wrote the Army in Vietnam, and the other, uh, of course, Colonel Harry Summers, who wrote on strategy. And let me try to go through it as quickly as I can. How am I doing time wise? Okay. Um, the argument for, for focusing on counterinsurgency among revisionists goes back to the beginning. Colonel Lansdale, who was um, an advisor to DM, John Paul Van, who many of you have heard of, and later um, David Hackworth. What Kopernovich blames is what he calls the army concept, the, the idea of conventional war using massive firepower inherited from World War II and the Cold War. And he argues the United States should have focused, first and foremost, on the internal threat to guerrilla insurgency. Um, not just on main force large guerrilla units, but on the smaller ones and on the political infrastructure. He argues that um, this caused us to miss the opportunity to miss opportunities um, to um, do counterinsurgency. And had we done this, we could have done this at a cost low enough to permit a continued presence in Vietnam. Others who have argued something similar to this are Gunther Lowy, uh, in his book that came out in 78. Um, Lieutenant Colonel John Nagel, who wrote a book called Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife, um, in which he blamed what he called um, the institutional culture of, of the Army and the use of what he called the hammer of firepower and divisions. And I think it's fair to say Lewis Sorley, uh, who uh, pointed out that uh, General Abrams, Creighton Abrams, learned from these mistakes and did much better. The other um, poll is from Colonel Summers. Um, and uh, what, what he writes is this. He writes that the United States responded as if it was an insurgency and made a mistake. And he calls search and destroy an intense form of counterinsurgency. We turned our um, attention, he says, because the source is in the north, to the symptom or the screen. Um, the source was North Vietnam. We should have isolated the battlefield. We should have cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail with American and Auburn troops at the 17th parallel. And also, he says, we should have at least used a threat of invasion um, to deter the South and force the North Vietnamese to keep their armies you know, on their side of the border. The flaw in what we did, he argued, was um, we um, allowed the North Vietnamese to control the war. Um, this put us on the strategic defensive, waiting on events. Now, here's something I, I think, I, at least that I found interesting. Um, Isolating the battlefield, of course, is not a new idea. General Westmoreland drew up plans in 1964. The JCS, um, Joint Chiefs of Staff, before this in 1965. And um, what, what emerges, I think, in this is that the, uh, um, the idea of, uh, of um, isolating the battlefield, it's not an either-or debate between people like Kopenovich and people like um, Summers. Um, and in fact, it brings them together. And my example of this is um, 
uh, and there he is, um, Colonel Victor Krulak, the, um, um, the Marine leader, very famous uh, person, very interesting guy, um, who was a, a strong critic of Westmoreland and Search and Destroy. He told Avril Harriman, the secretary, assistant secretary for Far Eastern Affairs, uh, early on, and, and the, the quote is up there, Harriman says, what do I do? Mine and destroy the port of Haiphong, destroy the rail lines, destroy the power, fuel, and heavy industry. Uh, this is, again, from somebody who's talking about um, counterinsurgency. The well-known Proven study, P-R-O-V-N study, which also um, advocated more intention, attention to counterinsurgency, also, as um, Andrew Bertel, an expert on counterinsurgency, has pointed out, recommended that the bulk of American forces should go against the base areas, as he put it, and the lines of communication, meaning base areas, the safe zones in Laos and Cambodia, where the communists could always retreat to when they had to, and uh, lines of communication, obviously, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Wu Ten, always useful, um, said, Hanoi was thinking about this, and as Boutin wrote, the greatest fear in Hanoi was that we would cut or cut just a small part of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. He quotes one person telling him, I'm scared to death they're going to do this, and that guy was the general in charge of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Um, it gets a little more complicated, actually, when you look at this. Uh, when you look at the thinking of some other military historians. And I, I want to talk about um, uh, a man named Dale Andrade, who um, I found very interesting. And I want to talk a little about what he said. Um, and, and, and what this does is it muddies the waters a little bit, the distinction between counterinsurgency and conventional warfare. What Andrade writes, and I think convincingly, is that we, what we faced is not simply a guerrilla war or a conventional war, but as he calls it, um, simultaneous guerrilla and main force war. And to ignore one or the other, he says, was doomed to failure. That's why he defends what General Westmoreland did when, after he got there in June of 64. He said, he, uh, McMor says Andrade, Westmoreland had to respond to the main force um, units he faced in 1964 when he took over. What he faced, says Andrade, was a perfect insurgency, a guerrilla war um, su um, supported by troops and supplies, as we know, from North Vietnam. This, of course, is critical of Kropanovich, but it's also critical of Summers, who, who uh, uh, criticizes Westmoreland for um, doing too much counterinsurgency with search and destroy. Says Andrade, West, Westmoreland had to do it given the military situation. Yes, it was attrition, and yes, it couldn't bring victory, but now we come to the key point that I started with earlier. What's the roots of this? The roots of this, he says, were in Washington. Um, they, on what Andrade calls the strategic limits that our military was faced with. They could not go into Cambodia, they could not go into Laos, and North Vietnam, at least in terms of any kind of ground action, was off limits as well. A political scientist named Christopher Gasek, who studied this, calls then search and destroy the residual strategy. That is what was left, says Andrade. All this, the restrictions from Washington, gave North Vietnamese an unbeatable advantage. And then he ups it further. And then he says, when you add in the support from China and from um, the Soviet Union, you had an unprecedented advantage. The North Vietnamese, as I think everyone in this room knows, could attack South Vietnamese and our soldiers over and over without the threat of significant retaliation. That said, it can be argued, and I think there's something to this, that all of it worked anyhow. And why is that? I think that comes when you look at the reason for the Tet Offensive, which essentially was a change in the strategy of North Vietnam. And you don't change strategies if things are going your way. Um, 
Basically, by 1966-67, uh, Hanoi was frustrated and worried. And among the people who have written about this in some detail, historians, or J you know, Jacob Wirtz, um, Colonel James Wilbanks has written a number of books on Vietnam, General Davidson. And interestingly, uh, another historian, uh, Colonel Gregory Davis, who basically supports the orthodox position. And even he writes that by 1966, um, Hanoi had lost the initiative uh, in, in South Vietnam. Bu Chen, always, again, I always come back to him, writes that by 1967 in Hanoi they felt that something really spectacular had to be done. Therefore, we get the Tet Offensive, a huge gamble, and um, as uh, Bob Turner has pointed out, and others as well, a gamble that failed. 